All right, welcome back to Meteorology 101. It's been a little while since I did a video, so I'm going to start a new series here. It's uh, Atmospheric Physics, and this may go on for a little while. I'll uh, make it quick as I can because physics can get pretty uh, painful, so just bear with me. Um, i got several uh, PowerPoint presentations to do. This is the first one, so I'll label that in the uh, description. And if you want to follow along through this course, we will cover uh, Physics 1, Physics 2, and then we'll get into Atmospheric Dynamics. So I'm not going too deep into the physics. Um, like I said, physics plays an important role in the atmosphere, but by the time you do all the calculations and try to figure it out for yourself, the weather's already happened and you just wasted your time. So most colleges and uh, weather courses require you to learn the physics. It's just to get a better understanding of what's happening in the atmosphere with uh, atmospheric pressure and what's actually going on to the micro level that you cannot see. So let's get started. <clears throat> atmospheric physics. This would be uh, part one. Physics one. All right. In atmospheric physics. We're going to cover atmospheric variables, atmospheric scales, atmospheric pressure temperature and moisture and the fundamental atmospheric concepts so atmospheric variables um, it gets into the math uh, what we need to learn is the fundamental quantities is mass is the amount of matter in an object length is a measurement of distance I know it seems pretty simple but these are just the basics so time is a period over <clears throat> which an action takes place Fundamental units, mass is a fundamental unit for mass is kilogram. That's how it's measured in weather. It's uh, You'll find weather is pretty much on the metric system. So get used to that. And length, the fundamental unit for length is meter. And time, fundamental unit is seconds. So where all this comes into play is significant digits of weather the digits greatly upon, depend upon the parameter of which you're dealing with. So the nearest reportable values for common measurements. <clears throat> so wind speed's five knots. We'll cover this here in just a minute. I'm going to pull up a uh, surface chart so you can uh, pretty much see what we're talking about. Um, how they round this off. Temperatures one tenth of a degree and that's on a skew T chart. Anything else is a whole degree. Everything's rounded up to the next whole degree. Anything if it's a 10.5 degrees then it is 11 degrees you'll see that on uh, weather observations um, any reports for weather reports you'll see it rounded to the whole degree the only time you ever see it is on a skew t chart which by that time it doesn't really matter because that chart is plotted out and you're just looking for certain aspects of that chart to determine uh, the stability of the atmosphere cloud height stuff like that so Winds on surface observation is whole knots. Uh, relative humidity is a whole percent. Pressure on a surface chart is one tenth, one point one millibar, and we'll go over that on the surface chart. And heights on the upper air charts is decameters. So the upper air charts is pretty much every ten thousand meters. Um, it's rounded through the. You'll see it on the uh, lines of equal height is what you'll find on the uh, upper air charts <clears throat> the scales that we cover <clears throat> actually let's go back to i'm going to pull up a uh, surface charts real quick let's see what we got here get my Okay, here's a surface chart. All right, so as we said, the winds are five knots rounded off to the whole, to five knots you'll see, you'll see either, you'll see no wind barb on the station will be calm winds. Typically what you'll see is a circle around that station that will be a report for calm winds. The one barb coming out and then that half barb 
just off of that wind direction the long bar was going to show you going into that station is what direction the winds are coming from winds are always from so this is coming from the south at five knots now that five knots it's rounded so that could be anywhere from three to seven knots so it's rounded to the nearest five there's half uh, barbs are fives the long barb is a 10 so you got like on this uh, station down in texas you have 15 knots which that could be anywhere from 12 to 17 knots on that wind speed so that's how they round that to the nearest five knots temperatures we only see the one tenth on the scoo t chart everything else is a whole degree so these are measured reported in a uh, whole degree so uh, station in illinois that's 63 degrees the dew point's 40 so you always see that in whole degrees the uh pressure on the surface chart is the point one the one tenth and these are in millibars so if you look at let me get a pin here if you look at one in ohio you're just going to add a 10 that's 1019.3 millibars Okay, so what we pretty much use in the weather field is millibars for the most part, but we can also use inches of mercury also. So we have 1,019 millibars. Over here down in uh, Oklahoma, 1,020.8. And then that's how they get these. They round it to the 10th the because when they do the isobars on the surface, that's the lines of equal pressure, then... They can get the a more accurate reading by having that tenth. So if we go to, I'll throw the um, isobars on this chart real quick. Just let the computer do the analysis. They'll be a little bit off. They always are. Uh, all computer systems are off. Okay, so here's our lines of equal pressure. So now we got a thousand twenty point nine millibars. And we know right here. That's where I say they're wrong, but 1,020 millibars is on that line. 1,020.9 is right there at that station. That's actually right because the 1,020.9 is within, inside that 20, so you get higher pressure as you go in. Every once in a while, you'll see that miss one. Like here, 1,020.1. This isobar should actually come around that station. So that's where the computer system kind of it wants these lines to be smooth. Because when you start analyzing a chart, you can get those rigid lines going around these stations. And what you're looking for is pressure and then this wind direction. So you want to keep the isobar kind of goes parallel with those isobars, but with the wind barbs. But the uh, you got to think about um, winds backing, slowing and backing on the surface too. So, you know, it'll never really go completely parallel because those winds are going to slow and back and then your pressure is going to change also so you'll end up with a uh iso bar just going a little bit crooked from the uh from that wind barb so that's just something to look out for um here's the one some out calm winds that would be the station plot with a circle around it that is calm winds so we got round stations square stations uh typically your square stations are automated your um or they get their uh have a weather observer uh the round ones ha actually have a weather station uh the different meetings on that stuff too so there's the station plots all right for the uh sounding we talk about uh to the point one degree on a skew teach chart so let's pull up a sounding real quick <clears throat> I can get to my sounding here. I can see it on your screen. All right, we'll just leave it there. So, if I can get the mouse to that. All right, let's see. Come on. 
some reason it's not going to let me pull that sounding for me to get to it but anyway without being able to point to it because i know you guys can see it the uh we start with zero move to the right you go to 10 move to the left you go to negative 10 every one of those solid brown lines is two degrees so you just count by twos up to 10 and then when you plot those temperatures so if the temperature was like 14.2 then the one on the right there would be you go two two lines over and then you just break that other two degrees up into the point and then you would add your dot so when you're plotting these things you actually add a dot to every level that was reported by the radio song the weather balloon that was sent up and then that all that data has to be decoded and then plotted on this chart and then you trace the lines up and you end up with what this looks like so that's the scooby t every point one and then you can actually at the bottom of the surface you can pick up a slight inversion that's a temperature increasing with height this has a slight inversion that's for wilmington ohio and then temperature naturally decreases with height so that's a normal uh, lapse rate and then which no, not really a normal lapse rate the lapse rate is like six and a half degrees celsius per thousand meters um <clears throat> the angle of that lapse rate as you decrease with height the steeper that gets the more unstable the environment is so you can actually pull <clears throat> get cloud heights off these things moisture levels instability and then you got all your instability indexes that are calculated off the skew t also so and you could follow all that by looking at <clears throat> these moist adiabatic lines that are the green curved lines and then the dry adiabatic lines which are the brown lines that are straight and to the left you can uh, pick out stability off of all that data we'll cover skew t's later on that's way further in depth right now we're just covering physics so get back to our powerpoint okay so <clears throat> atmospheric scales <clears throat> with the scales they measure weather off of the macro scale synoptic scale meso scale and the micro scale so the, ma mic the macro scale or the global scale some call it is pretty much we're looking at the uh, arctic the earth from the north pole and you can pretty much see the jet stream running all the way around and that is the macro scale that is 2,000 kilometers or greater or greater than 2,000 kilometers so across the united states about 2,000 kilometers anything greater than that is considered a macro scale time scale several days or several weeks so it could take you know a jet max to push into the united states it could take several days several weeks depending on where a jet max is coming from and the example has the jet axis and atmospheric general circulation so all, this is pretty much if you look at this as a say polar vortex you can see the troughs of ridges going around the uh the arctic and uh that when we get the polar outbreaks that start to come down and push through the united states to get an outbreak from that uh from that uh polar vortex also All right, an example of the jet axis is where your jet maxes are and uh just your jet in, in general going all the way across the united states greater than 2,000 kilometers that could be you know that is a macro scale phenomenon all right synoptic scale i just think of that as uh, highs lows uh the synoptic situation that's going on in uh, frontal systems so anything from 200 to 2,000 kilometers you can have a frontal system stretching across the united states that, that could give you a pretty long uh distance but it being a frontal system it is still on the synoptic scale and the time frame on that is tens of hours or several days as a front like this uh, high pressure system like a polar outbreak push to the south the front drop down that could take several days to get across the united states and push off the east coast so examples of that <clears throat> frontal systems tropical cyclones including hurricanes tropical storms so that is all on the synoptic scale basically think of it as the synoptic situation meso scale <clears throat> just think of is a screen messy is there weather uh great like weather radar then uh 
you can go from 2 to 926 kilometers or 1 to 500 uh, nautical miles. And time scale is tens of minutes to several hours. So these frontal systems, as they push through, or a uh, prefrontal trough, um, area of instability can push through that could just that could take just you know tens of minutes just to push through your area or it could take a few hours depending on how fast that system is moving so uh, examples of that the massive scale are thunderstorms and sea breezes micro scale now we're talking about um, anything less than two kilometers and that is you know clouds and the time scale of that is just a few seconds to a few minutes so if you look at a cloud Within a few seconds or a few minutes, you can see if that cloud is growing, dissipating. That is going to be a different cloud in just a few minutes. So turbulent flow, updrafts, downdrafts, that's examples of the micro scale. All right, relationships, <clears throat> variable relationships we're looking at. These are measurements of atmospheric pressure, um, phenomena, what we talked about at the beginning, the mass, uh, area, length, time, um, when we're calculating, say, force, pressure, uh, weight, stuff like that, then we have to see what the variable relationships are between each part of the equation. So <clears throat> variable relationship, compare the effects of variables making up an equation. The relationship exists when increasing one variable in the equation will cause the other two to increase. So it's a directly proportional so an example we'll get on the next page um we'll show you here in a minute inversely proportional is if you change one variable in the equation it causes the other one to decrease so if you increase one the other decreases that is inversely proportional to each other one goes up one goes down directly proportional if you change one the other one goes up so it we'll get into it now um when determining the relationship of variables you got to follow the rules um, the only two variables can be compared at one time to determine the relationship with each other. So, if there are more than two variables in an equation, the others must be held constant. So, placing a dot over each variable that is held constant can represent that at the time we evaluate the dependence of the two variables by increasing the value of one and determine the effect on the other. So, like I said, if you increase one, the other increases, that's directly proportional. Um, the effect depends on the orientation of each variable in the equation and each side of the equal sign must result in the same change in order to remain equal. So whenever you increase one, the other one has to change. It has to either change equally up or down. So that's how it remains equal. It goes, if you increase one, it decreases the other. They're inversely proportional, but they are changing at the same time. And if we determine the relationship between X and Z, in x equals y times z, then the y must be must be held constant. Increasing the x will cause the z to increase. These are directly proportional. Talk about force. Talk about Newton's second law of motion. Force is a push or pull capable of changing the state of motion of an object. Since force has magnitude as well as direction, it is a vector. So you have two forces going against each other, and the equation is. Force equals mass times area, where m is mass of the object, a is the acceleration of an object, units are kilograms meter per, meters per second squared, or a newton, and force is directly proportional to mass when acceleration is assumed constant. For example, if the mass increases by a factor of 10, what will happen to the force? If you increase the mass, acceleration stays the same then the force will increase. So just remember, force and weight are two different things, too. So don't, try not to get those confused. Your acceleration, you know, like weight would be your acceleration or your uh, movement will be gravity. So if you're talking about weight, how much force something's, an object's putting on something. A <clears throat> little bit, two different things, depending on the acceleration, and then gravity remains constant always. Acceleration doesn't have to remain constant. That's the difference between force and weight. So the increased force, you have to increase the mass. Acceleration remains constant. If acceleration remains constant, you decrease the mass, then the force has to decrease. So they are directly proportional. So 
to increase force, mass remains constant. You have to increase the acceleration to increase that force. That's also directly proportional with each other. So weight is a type of force defined using a specific acceleration due to gravity. And the equation is W equals mg, where W is weight of the object, M is the mass of the object, and G is the acceleration due to gravity. So, like I said, talking about acceleration, gravity is always constant. So it's a little bit different than the force. The direction is always toward the surface of the Earth. The magnitude is assumed to be constant. And gravity equals 9.8 meters per second squared. And the units are the same as force. So, <clears throat> variable relationships, weight is only dependent upon the mass since gravity is constant. So if you want to increase the mass, you have to increase the if you don't increase the weight, you have to increase the mass. So weight is directly proportional to mass, the same as force. If the mass increases, the weight increases. If mass decreases, the mass the weight the mass decreases, the weight decreases. So they are directly proportional since gravity is constant. Okay, now I'm just zipping through this. Um, so <clears throat> In the atmosphere, gravity is always constant. If you take an air parcel and you increase or decrease the mass of that air parcel, then you increase the mass, the weight is, obviously it's heavier, so the weight will increase. Decrease the mass of that air parcel, then it would decrease the, the weight of that object. Okay, of that air parcel. I uh, just jumped a little bit. Let's go, uh, <clears throat> weight, W, Increase the weight, increase the mass. Gravity remains constant. So increase the mass, you increase the weight. Decrease the mass, you decrease the weight. That's just as simple as that with, with weight in the atmosphere. The atmosphere exerts force on the surface of the Earth equal to its weight. This is very important in the concept in weather. For example, if the amount of the mass in a column of atmosphere increases, what happens to the force exerted upon the surface of the Earth? The surface, Earth's surface by a column. So if you increase the amount of mass in a column increases, then the weight will increase. Always directly proportional because gravity is constant. Uh, here's a column of air. The weight, the mass, you increase the mass, you're going to increase the weight. Gravity is always constant. Uh, atmospheric pressure so <clears throat> now we're talking about pressure equals force over area so <clears throat> if you want to decrease the pressure force stays the same you increase the area so we got these triangles and we once we invert them then we lose area so our pressure will increase so if you have 30 newtons 15 per meter squared is your acceleration. 15 meters squared is your area. And 5 meters squared is your area when that inverted. So now you have taken the area. 30 newtons of force. Which remains constant. Across both of these. Then you decrease the pressure. Because you're spreading it across more area. When you decrease that area. Now you're putting too much more pressure on a smaller area. Now you will increase the pressure because the force remains the same. So it's still 30 newtons and then you decrease the area. So that's indirectly proportional area and pressure and increase area, decrease pressure, decrease area, increase pressure. So if you take a high pressure system that doesn't cover as much area but has the same mass then you have a, you will have a higher pressure in the center of that of that high pressure system <clears throat> you actually read a higher reading which would be <clears throat> clearer skies because you're the moisture it can't hold moisture the higher pressure the less moisture it just squeezes the moisture out cannot hold the moisture in that area so the higher the pressure the lower the moisture content <clears throat> but the cold air you have a more of a cold core high is what that's going to come down to and you're the cold air can't hold as much moisture as warm air so it pushes that moisture out but it's a cold air is more dense than warm air so the density is higher so 
over a smaller area, now you have an increased pressure. All right, measuring atmospheric pressure, take a column of air. Standard atmospheric pressure is 29.92 inches. About uh, 10, uh, 1,013 uh, millibars. Mercury barometer <clears throat> pressure is measured as the height of a column of mercury in the in the evacuated tube. An increase in pressure causes the height of the mercury to increase. Pressure is measured in millimeters or inches of mercury. That would be actually <clears throat> pressure is measured in millibars or inches of mercury which can be converted to pressure units 2.92 is 1013.2 millibars that's just a conversion that's standard atmospheric pressure all right measuring instruments uh, galileo tippet thermometer that was uh <clears throat> embedded in the 1500s a water thermometer and it had these glass bulbs with different densities of fluid in those and then a clear liquid that filled that tube so as the density, the temperature changed, the density of the clear liquid changed, and then that would allow these balls to either float or sink, depending on if they were more dense than that clear liquid or less dense. And then that would tell the temperature. <clears throat> the mercury barometer by uh, Torricelli in the 1640s. Uh, mercury in a tube, pressure on the mercury, mercury rises, increased pressure. So... We use millibars or inches of mercury, and I've talked about these a little bit more in depth in another video you could visit. Um, it might be on that site, meteorology101.com slash atmospheric dash structure, and that's, that video may be embedded into that screen. Or you just go to my YouTube channel, and you can find, uh, you can find atmospheric, um, I think it was, uh, fundamentals of atmosphere or uh one other powerpoint videos one of my most watched can't miss it so i don't have a i do have about 60 or 70 videos so but it wouldn't be too hard to find it anyway uh weather instruments uh thermometer pretty much like the thermometer we uh, see today two different scales fahrenheit scale uh, proposed in 1724 by a german physicist uh, Celsius scale, a Swedish astronomer in 1742, named it the centigrade scale, and then the Kelvin scale as a uh, British inventor or scientist, William Thompson. And the Kelvin scale is pretty much the scale that's <clears throat> it's used to calculate the sun stability factors in the atmosphere. Um, also, there's a uh, zero degree Kelvin is when all molecular activity comes to a stop. That's uh, we've never got that cold i think we've gotten uh down in the 30s by freezing uh forcing a freeze on something um got it to slow down pretty good but never came down never got to the zero all right it's pretty much the end of that video so this is uh atmospheric physics one we are going to do several of these for physics one i think i have about five slideshows prepared right now so um i know i went a little fast on some stuff uh probably not in as much depth as a lot of people would like like i said by the time you kind of do any calculations on gravity and how much mass is in the atmosphere and you uh what your pressure should be just walk over to your weather station and look at the pressure um they report it every hour unless you have your own weather station that's pretty much reported consistently so <clears throat> Pressure right now is 1,016 millibars in southwest Ohio, uh, 56.5 degrees, 70% humidity, uh, dew point of 45 degrees, and the winds are calm. So with the temperatures cooling off, the moisture we had, we had the rainstorms come through, the thunderstorms, uh, we did get some moisture, the vegetation's wet, and with the cold air moving over the warmer waters, uh, you see lakes and uh, ponds, stuff like that, letting off a little bit of uh, steam. Um, a little bit of fog and uh then the valleys cooling and they had a lot of valley fog and uh some uh radiation fog with the uh cold air suppressing that moisture to the surface being calm winds can't dissipate that fog so uh we had some pretty good fog this morning all right i'm gonna jump over <clears throat> to some weather charts real quick and 
sea level pressure is lines equal pressure. Typically, you'll start out with a service chart with the data. Um, so you want to see where the highs and lows are. Got a low pressure system over the west and high pressure system that dropped down. Brought that cold front through well off the uh, east coast now. High pressure dominating the south, the whole eastern United States. So you might see some modification here, but winds out of the north wrapping around. Uh, moisture coming up into Texas, maybe some cloudiness there. Um, 1,020 millibar high. It's a pretty high pressure system. So I'd say pretty much the whole Midwest is probably pretty clear. Um, we'll go look at a satellite and uh, see what we got there. So let's go to uh, let's look at our temperature lines. Let's go to we'll pull up our station plots also. Like I said, by the time you do any calculations, you already got your surface chart. You can see what's going on in the atmosphere. We got high pressure. We know that. We don't have to calculate gravity, you know, mass of the atmosphere and, you know, weight. So we can see this high pressure system just like a water bubble just coming down through the United States, uh, all misformed. So, like I said, if you go to analyze these charts based on that data, you can see where some of this is off so these lines will get pretty sharp um if you want to get a more accurate picture because you can get minor short waves that come around this high and just a little short wave trough embedded into the high and you can get an area with a little bit more cloud cover you know that gets more significant with aviation weather if you're briefing a pilot to fly across the united states he wants to know what the cloud heights are going to be the freezing levels the uh, winds at that flight level and uh, above and below that flight level just so he can determine you know what the intensity of uh, turbulence might be going across the US also and then of course the moisture uh, getting to the upper levels you know you got to know the moisture in those upper levels because of aircraft icing you get above the freezing level the aircraft goes through ice builds up on the planes they have the icy equipment but they want to know if you get into any heavy icing, their equipment can't keep up with the icing, they can get into big trouble. So that's the significance between, you know, giving a weather forecast, saying high pressure moving through the area, clear skies, a front moving through the area. And then basically most weather stations wait until the day of, maybe the day before, to, you know, if the storm prediction center saying, hey, there's a pretty good chance of uh severe storms in this area then they'll wait till you know the day before or the day of actually to give out warnings they can't really put out warnings you know a day before and say hey we have a tornado warning for this area you know for tomorrow that doesn't work that way the micro scale is so fast that they have to see what's happening in real time that's why it's so important how how quick they can get that data how fast they could process it come up with a warning area and push it through to give those weather stations you know time to prepare especially if you're on an airfield you know if you're out here at cherry point north carolina and you know you got winds of you got a wind warning coming through they gotta they gotta strap planes down they have to get them in the hangars um they got a lot of procedures they have to take just based on a wind warning if they get a gust you know or sustained winds at 20 knots you know that's being sustained 20 knots or more on a wind warning they could you know that could blow a plane you know just over a little bit and hit another plane so they got you know that's where they got to strap them down you know, to the flight line and then uh you know to prevent any damage so they got a lot of decisions to make over there like i said your weather stations are pretty much you know your high temperature is going to be from here to here your low temperature here to here you know chance of rain 30 percent chance of rain you know chance of thunderstorms in the afternoon okay what happens you know somebody gets rained on you know so it's a it's a much 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 different world um with aviation weather that's why i say when you go to analyze these charts if you don't get into detail when even on the severe weather side you know you got to get you got to understand the dew points you know, understand those station plots every aspect of that station plot so you can plot this chart and be able to determine the, where to pinpoint you know that supercell or that tornado i mean you can see in this chart unless i zoomed into missouri you know, I only got about five plots in missouri so you know there's really not a whole lot of data there to work with i mean i can increase that 
and it, if I increase it with the whole United States out here, it will just get so cluttered you won't be able to read it. This is just a general idea. Um, if I want to go into one state, I can zoom all the way into that state, and then I can add every plot within that state, and then I can start looking at dew points, temperatures, dew points, pressures, and I can watch, you know, where, kind of pinpoint where something's going to happen. So you can see these high, higher winds of uh, 15 to 20 knots, you know, throughout the the south, and then you can see that tighter uh, pressure gradient across that high from the high to the low pressure. You know, that's where you'll get winds are blowing clockwise around a high and out of a high. So they're always going to be forcing and pushing out of the high, and then they're going to be blown into the low. So they'll go counterclockwise around the low and then into the low. So as you see, these winds are blowing into the low pressure system. These winds are blowing out of the high pressure system. And as that pressure gradient tightens, if this high pressure system is moving slow and that low pressure system wants to push down, it'll just bump into the high pressure system and tighten that gradient. You won't, it won't be able to move that high. High is always, always a rule. Now you can get a high pressure system, push it down and push a low pressure system out of the way it'll push a hurricane out of the way then you get a tight you know you get a tight gradient and get some uh, pretty significant winds so that is pretty much a surface chart like i said you're gonna have the winds temperature dew point pressure and then you'll have your cloud cover these are black it's all overcast skies the one with the three fourths of that circle that's a broken that's a ceiling Consider the ceiling is a broken, uh, at least five eighths of the sky, uh, depending on how that station measures it. It could be, you know, ten tenths, you know, eight tenths of the sky being broken or something. So um, most of this is overcast. It's hour you want to break that horizon up into eight parts or ten parts. The aviation weather does it in eight, so um, eight eighths is overcast. Five to seven eighths is broken, and then. Uh, you got scattered in a uh, few. So few is uh, one to uh, one quarter of the sky is just a few. And then half of that circle being colored in will be scattered. And then three fourths is broken. And then the whole thing is overcast. So, all right. Um, let's do one upper air chart. We'll do a uh, 500 millibar. That's pretty the typical uh, height for looking for significant moisture stuff like that so let's go with let's go 500 let's see if there's any moisture on here with the high pressure system over the eastern united states that's most of that will probably be dry depending on how high that high pressure system goes it could go uh it just be a shallow high and then the upper levels will be a uh, you know you could have upper level low upper level trough you know a lot of upper level moisture looks like most of our moisture is to the north this just runs an algorithm and then keeps the dew points so it'd be any dew point that's a five five degree dew point depression you know it's a different five degree difference between uh, temperature and dew point will be significant moisture and this kind of plots that out a little bit too you'll see areas of uh other significant moisture the computer doesn't catch because the time frames are different when it downloads the upper level moisture versus these charts. These charts are upper air charts are only put out every 12 hours. And that's when you get into uh, a lot of data that you got just a big gap between data and you're going off of old data to try to determine what's happening in the atmosphere. That's why you got to understand this, these charts. So you can say, hey, is that ridge building or weakening? Is the trough deepening or filling? That's the terminology for those troughs and ridges. And you need to know what's happening with that ridge or that trough to determine is that weather going to get better or is it going to get worse? Is it going to affect these storms? A frontal system is it going to, you know, how is it going to affect that by, you know, that trough, you know, deepening or getting more intense. Now, if you look at this one, just looking at this, you got a uh, your constant height. Your contours and your isotherms, which the lines of equal temperature, they're pretty much parallel with each other. So that's pretty weak. Um, there's no temperature advection. So you don't have to worry about temperature advection being pushed into this trough. And then if you got a warm air advection, you know, deepening this thing, then you're losing mass out of the out of that area. 
and then that trough would deepen if you it caused you to lose that mass so you don't uh with a bare clinic system you're going to see that temperature advection you know if you got cold air advection going into the trough or you have the warm air advection and that would help you determine if that trough is going to deepen or fill so just the overall weather system the upper level support to determine you know what you have so we have a high pressure system over the eastern united states we're backing over to a trough a ridge in the uh central united states so we got we're we're supported by a upper level ridge so now we got downward pressure pushing down off that ridge and that's suppressing all the weather so now you can see we got all clear pretty much clear skies all through the eastern united states we had all of them broken clouds we had the the uh, system moving over in the northwest so overcast and then we got dew point depressions of five a four a four the four so now we have significant moisture so take this green get it off of those empty spots with 18 uh dew point depression put all that green right over here and there's your significant moisture in the upper levels so they'll be seeing you know clouds at least build up or clouds up to the uh 500 millibar which is about 18,000 feet so there's you know clouds there but the mountains are pretty high too so you know 18,000 feet is um where the significant moisture is on this level uh so we just did the 500 we did the surface we'll get more into the charts a little bit later um we'll continue with the series on uh atmospheric physics we'll do part two next and uh expect that out within the next week and then uh just let me know how you think about this video and i'll keep them coming so uh thanks for watching